Bay Arthur Liu is going to have a talk about uh, Google, Sum Google Summer of Code. He was himself a Google Summer of Code student a few years ago. That's actually more or less how we get involved in Debian. And as I remember the talk, I let mm -hmm. uh, Arthur Bay um, talk. If you have questions, it's best if you can wait to the end of the event. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I hear myself. Uh, so this is the same talk as last year, except it's totally different because we have different students. And it's been a few years that since the program started. Uh, I don't know if you remember, it all started in 2005, where it was kind of a small affair with a few people and a few organizations and everything by email and so on. Uh, then 2006, 2007, it got larger and larger. Uh, Debian started participating in 2006, and we've been participating in every edition since. So this is the sixth time the program existed, the fifth that Debian participated, and it has worked very well for us so far. So just to remind you what's the program for, mm. the idea is it's around open source. It's about code, of course, uh, because of the name. Uh, it's about getting open source code created, but more importantly, not by anyone. It's mostly about young developers who didn't have any much contact with uh, the free software movement. And the idea is for this, all these projects to be able to identify these people and bring them into the movement uh, so that they can be the next generation of developers. It's also a way for the students to be able to do something during the summer that remotely related uh, to what they have been studying, um, like not working at McDonald's. And it's also a way uh, outside of the open source movement to work on real software projects uh, on a large scale uh, with real people working on it on large distributed teams, which is not something that they often get to do at school. And in some ways, uh, developing in the free software movement is uh, quite special with all the mailing list etiquettes that is even more important. The software licensing question that we actually do care about and the fact that most developers just haven't seen each other since the last April. So the roles in the program, it's, there are three roles. Uh, Google, who's financing it, uh, organizations such as Debian and all the students. So the Google selects uh, multiple organizations. This year is about 150 of different organizations. Uh, anything related to free software uh, from operating systems like Debian to desktops like GNOME or software like Blender or, yeah, they're very long, long list. So what Google does is assign a certain number of slots to each organization and each organization can then uh, rank uh, students who apply for each organization for certain projects. And Google says you have 10 slots and, and Debian choose uh, which 10 students we want to have. That's the way it works. Uh, the Google gives a stipend of uh, $500 to the organization that the organization is free to use at its sees fit and $5,000 uh, to each student as a stipend for the summer. And there's also a variable quantity of money that uh, Google gives to each organization uh, when they are able to organize events such as DevConf so that they can uh, actually sponsor students to come. Uh, this year we've been able to get six Summer of Code students to come thanks to special sponsoring from Google outside of uh, the <coughs> usual uh, money. And yeah, we are very thankful for this. Uh, we've been able to get many more students than last year and we hope to get uh, more next year. So what's new this year? Uh, it's the same old admin as last year, which is me. Uh, we still have about 30 project ideas coming from developers. Uh, so we like to have, we always like to have more, pro more project proposals because it's in some way, each student goes through this list of organization that participate in the program and they click on this link that says ideas. And this list of ideas is really what students will look for. And we had a list of about 30 projects. And compared to some other organization, it wasn't that much. 
So I hope that we'll get uh, some more next year. We've got about 80 student applications, uh, which is slightly more than last year, and is a very good score for an obscure organization uh, like Debian compared to more popular distributions or very uh, popular stuff such as Firefox or OpenOffice that is popular outside of even Linux. So Debian did quite well. We got 11 slots, uh, the same as last year. Uh, even though we there were more organizations participating this year, so usually each organization got less than last year. But we did quite well in that we got the same number of slots as last year. So after the bonding period, uh, the first uh, the first month we kept nine because of various reasons. Uh, so we had a student who was transferred and another who left for various reasons. Uh, this year, after the midterm review, which happened uh, a week ago, so we're right at the middle of the summer, we had the first review and we kept eight of these nine students. Uh, one was eliminated for insufficient reasons. But I'm quite happy that uh, all the other passed, which is the usual record. So, uh, is anyone here not a Debian developer or something? Is there any of you who are students? Okay, for the three of you. Uh, you might have come because you wanted to participate in the summer course. Uh, so, a few tips, uh, very important ones, is to get in touch with your organization as early as possible. Uh, the, the official application period is something in March or April. But if you get in touch with your organization, and I'd hope it's with Debian, uh, we, would, we will know you, you will know us, you know how it stuff works, and it will be so much easier for us to know what will work, and it greatly increases your chances to uh, be selected as a Debian student. So I'd highly encourage you to talk to me or any of the students who are present today uh, to talk about what you'd like to do at Debian or uh, as part of the sum of code in general. Uh, so developers, this year I see many people in this room, but I don't see that many on the mailing list or on RSP. Uh, I really wonder why. It's, it's really easy to help the program because I'm sure that each one of you is doing something in, in Debian and that you'd certainly like to have someone else, someone else help you doing it. Maybe you have some ideas that you just don't really have the time to, uh, to, to realize and that you would like to have someone have fun for a summer doing it and you could help with it. So the Summer of Code is really a great program to get some maybe a little crazy stuff done during the summer. So I highly encourage you to uh, get in touch with me to propose your idea. And when the, the idea proposal period comes, to propose it, and even better, to be a mentor for it. It's really a great experience, and anyone who's been a mentor in the program at Debian can tell you how great it is. So it's not really about me. Uh, I'm done with talking. So right now, we're going to get every student to come up and present what he's been doing during the summer so far. Hello, uh, my name is Piotr Galiuszewski, I'm from Poland and I'm working this summer on uh, Aptitude Kit project. My, mentor, my mentors are Sune Borella and Daniel Barrows. Uh, go the main goal of my project is to create a Qt based front end for Aptitude. Uh, this front end should have at the end of the summer, uh, or probably a little, er little later, uh, all, all features from uh, GTK front end or Encarcel front end. And probably some of you will ask me why are you, one, are you, why are you like working on the project uh, which is involving a new package manager. There is a plenty of package managers uh, currently available. And uh, I think that this table could show it. Uh, as for GTK-based uh, desktop environments, there are 
two good uh, package managers with full Debian compliant with advanced uh, features uh, like Synaptic and Aptitude GTK, but for KDE there is only iDebt, which is currently an maintained project, and due to that, due to that, uh, it's impossible. To, uh, there is no no one uh, good project for uh, good. I'm sorry, there is no uh, working uh, package manager for KDE. So what will we do after the summer when the my project will be completed? Uh, there will be available up to UQT and also the Kubunters uh, create a Muon project. So this will be quite better state. And what works now after the as months of my works? Uh, it's possible to both package packages and search it of them. And by default, our uh, packages are, show are shown on the list. And uh, later it's possible to search them on two ways. It's a uh, fast search where you can uh, type a text where you which will be uh, searched and, and choose a category for it. And second thing is uh, support from uh, for aptitude uh, the search patterns. It's also possible to show uh, more advanced information about these packages uh, like uh, list of uh, available list of installed files or uh, change logs. It's also possible to work some of the work on uh, some of the jobs of pa uh, packaging, like updating package cache, uh, make, make clean, uh, up to get clean job or auto clean. And other package actions are also implemented, so you can choose if the such package should be installed, reinstalled, or maybe uh, kept or change of version. So it's also possible to perform these changes. So it's possible. So working inside packages works, but there is also a lot of work required for this. I'm currently working on adding missing features, and also I'm still updating and rebasing patches according to Daniel's comments. Our comments are made on aptitude mailing list. And so it's a, a small screenshot which show current state of the project, and there is a. Uh, a list of uh, filters currently is empty, whether it, it, it will be added uh, later, and list of packages. One of packages is extended for now. It there is shown uh, some more adv more advanced information about these patches, like the description versions, also homepage, and there is a hot link to more information. After uh, clicking, is open at uh, new tabs. So because I'm trying to avoid using of new many windows uh, at, at this project. Only there is one window at the at time. Probably there will be one, one or two more, for example, configuration. But there is also will be possible to have multiple uh, multiple mine views, uh, mine windows at the same time. And uh, at the bottom of the this uh, window is shown a uh, pro global progress bar of currently running jobs. After clicking on show details button, there is a new tab open it which uh, show progress of currently uh, of each file which is downloaded. So what needs be to be done on the, onto this project? Uh, there are showing changes somewhere integrating Vauki Fauti terminal into perform changes tab, so because uh, this terminal will be used to show a progress of the DPGTA running, running. And uh, also there is some missing tabs uh, which has to be added. And also polishing GUI and fixing remaining bugs. There is a lot of work to do, so probably this project will be. I will be so I will be continuing this project after uh, so the summer of code, but I hope that uh, till the end of the summer, most of these features should be implemented in some way, and later till the end of the year, all of this should be. I hope this will, will be uh, merged into Aptitude Master Branch. So how can you help me? I will be very glad to hear any feedback on the design decisions I have made. I posted uh, mockups on my blog, which is aggregated in Planet, uh, Planet Debian, about two months ago. I received some comments. I'm very, I'm very appreciated. It. Uh, so you can test the front end. Here, the front end, uh, some informations about installing uh, this front end is on this hot link. Uh, there is new, there is new uh, configuration option option uh, en enable Qt required to add. As a repository uh, of this project is on Gitorio's project, and s snapshots are on my page of the current state of the project. It's because uh, there is no single branch which can post and later will be updated by pushing, uh, pulling from repository. 
because uh, every feature is in uh, added in new branch and every branch in every part is always is often rebased, uh, rewritten according to comments on aptitude mailing list. So it's better to, ta to test this uh, project on uh, computing snapshots. Here is also a contact for me. If you have any questions, I will, be I will answer them here in WebCon or you can write me email or on aptitude mailing list. I also will be on uh, Debian on Debian Davis uh, channel in a minute. DevCon to Davis channel in, in, in a couple of minutes. Thank you very much. Hi, <coughs> one, two, three. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Krzysztof Tuszecki, and uh, I am working on content our config files upgrading project. My mentor is Dominic Dumont. The goal of this project is to improve package upgrades with semantic configuration merge. This may sound a little bit cryptic, but uh, a simple example I will show you later uh, will give you an idea what it's all about. So, <coughs> what already works? Well, um, so when I was applying for a summer of code, I was thinking of creating my own library and uh, creating all the tools by myself. But it turned out there there's already a great tool for parsing man manipulating configuration files and it's called config model. <coughs> it's a parallel library created by Dominic Dumont. Uh, and uh, if you want to use that library, each uh, configuration file uh, needs to have a model. A model is a simple parallel data structure which describes all elements uh, of a configuration file and what can be put into these elements. Uh, and uh, as you may imagine, uh, complete models uh, uh, are great, but uh, tend to be long and complicated because uh, the developer needs to describe uh, each uh, config file element separately, and uh, this may take a long time in the case of web servers, for example. Uh, and uh, some config files still cannot be parsed because uh, some read and write backends in config model are missing some key features. Well. And uh, after a few weeks of my work, uh, now I made uh, creating uh, models uh, easier because uh, in the case of upgrading files, uh, we do not need to have uh, each element of the config file described. We just want to load it and make some semantic comparison. So uh, instead of describing each element separately, uh, uh, Dominic suggested to me that I should uh, make it possible to uh, put uh, a regular expression that describes a set of elements and how they could behave. And that is uh, how it works now. Uh, I've also improved the existing backend for new files and uh, I'm working on merging configuration files now. So officially I can't work here, so I will continue my work after I come back to Poland. So what have we done so far? As I said before, uh, model is, uh, can be declared now in simplified way. And such models are not describing structures of the file exactly, but are suitable for upgrades. Uh, and I improved the inner backend. And uh, as uh, this added value, uh, config model can also handle more complex upgrades by describing upgrades for parameters that needs to be changed during the upgrade. I will show you an example of such action in that demonstration. It is now. So let's suppose we have a very, very simple configuration file that consists of only one parameter. Well, this is some kind of command that is being uh, executed of in some program. Well, in the default version of the config file, it is uh, bash executed. And the uh, user didn't like bash, so he changed the uh, default shell to uh, ZSH. And for no apparent reason, the author of the uh, package decided to uh, extend this, his application and to modify the default config file. And now uh, he the role of the command parameter uh, is actual command, but the command is still there and is uh, working in a different way, serving a different function. Well, the default uh, behavior now uh, to preserve user configuration in DevConf will be to use the UCF tool. UCF tool in this case would throw an error um, and uh, wouldn't uh, do a freeway merge. If you would like to uh, compare this and merge this file as a text, we couldn't preserve user settings and preserve the new default settings because it's impossible. Uh, but it's possible using config model and semantic match. 
uh, using features uh, of this library, we can define that the uh, um, contents of the old command variable should be transferred to the actual command, and the new command should be added to the new config file. And using uh, and uh, using my mm, using cases of my work, uh, the actual match config file will be looks like this. So uh, the user settings is preserved, and the new settings is still there. That's how it works. And what needs to be done? We're still not uh, very well tested, and uh, uh, some things should to be improved. And there's also not uh, testing being done yet in the actual packages. We need to test it more. We need to write uh, some additional backs, uh, backends, most notably a backend for XML uh, configuration files. This format is pretty common now. And uh, to write some documentation. And how we can help? Uh, of course, uh, test this software by performing upgrade to the convention files. We, need to uh, we can check if it works in real life. Integrate config model in the posting script of the package maintain. It would be very helpful. And uh, hand for backs, of course. And uh, all the code is hosted on the repository on Mercurial. So that's all. Thank you. Right here? That's good. Hello, I'm uh, David Went. This is my, my project. Um, uh, I'm working on uh, in modifying the uh, SOAP API for Debugs, which is the software which powers our BTS, so that you can now modify and uh, report new bug reports into the system without using email. So this is a pretty cheap diagram I rigged up of uh, how the whole system works. Basically, uh, as you know, so we have the SOAP API, and we're going. I'm going to add new functions so that now you can report bugs, follow up, close, forward, etc., from uh, pretty much any language. Heck, we might even have a, some sort of nice little user interface for that. Um, uh, what does that mean for uh, end users? Is uh, well for programmers, it means that you can now interface with debugs quite easily. Um, uh, it's much easier, simple, less error prone than uh, firing off an email. So um, uh, it also makes it easier for users because now we could write something like, say, a a bug report program or something like report bug, but that does not require using the email. And they don't have to, or send, and they don't have to like send the email themselves, which, which is good for new users. And there's also so all sorts of different example usages that you could that you could take the API and use it with. Like you could write an automated crash reporter that says, "Hey, your pro the program crashed. Would you like to send a bug report and make it really easy?" You could even write like an automated package tester, which says, "Ooh, your test case failed. Do you want to send a bug report?" Etc. Um, uh, and uh, this is, an, if you want to like send an email or something, uh, or bug me on AIM. Yes, that's my that's my actual face. <coughs> mm -hmm. I'm gonna give, give, uh, give a shout out to these people who, who from without them I probably would not be working on this obviously. Bastian Venter is my mentor, Don Armstrong, who's the uh, debugs maintainer, and Obey Arthur Liu, and Google. <laughs> Sorry if that was a little short. Hi, I'm working on um, porting a Debian installer to the Neo Forerunner. Neo Forerunner uh, is, a, is, a, is a phone um, with uh, only free software and uh, almost only open hardware. You have um, 
for exam instance, uh, the GSM chip, which is uh, completely closed, but uh, the driver is, uh, is free, is a free software. Um, there is, a, there is a, a Glamour chip too. Um, the documentation is not available, but uh, the driver itself is free software. Uh, unfortunately, it's not produced anymore. <laughs> so, uh, current situation on new free runners um, in Debian Cloud. Uh, we have a PTG FSO, uh, which works uh, on uh, the, um, the phone applications and uh, even the kernel. Everything uh, they make uh, stays in a, in a repository before uh, going to main. There is an install.sh script that, um, that is meant to be run in an um, already installed system on the free runner. And uh, it's, um, it's in the debug traps uh, Debian and uh, do some things to so it can run on the free runner. And uh, we have the uh, a kernel in the PKJ FSO repository. Uh, this, this kernel doesn't follow uh, the kernel packaging uh, uh, like uh, every other packages on main uh, do and does. So uh, I ha one of my goal is to provide uh, a new flavor. Sorry. So I've, um, I've made a new config for this 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 flavor that uh, supports uh, only the free runner for now that supports over some that can support over something devices, um, but uh, we miss uh, many drivers like the Grano driver. It's not upstream, so I had to clean it and fix something. Then I. I submitted it to upstream, but I've not I have haven't got any review yet. Uh, I've done some uh, Debian installer work too, like uh, adding a new submerge. That's uh, three lines of code uh, here and here, but uh, you have to know. Um, I've um, I'm working uh, on um, U-boot installer. That's a tool that uh, make it possible to to read the, the bootloader information as the bootloader stays in the free runner and you don't modify it. Uh, it stays in the free runner, but uh, the default config uh, um, doesn't let uh, us uh, run Debian. So you uh, we have to modify it a bit and that's uh, what uh, boot installer is for. Um, we ha uh, I have made um, an installation uh, script that uh, runs on the host that's made uh, to be easy to be uh, to use and um, to avoid uh, some uh, U-boot uh, bug uh, like um, having to copy the line but not too fast or else uh, U-boot will stop uh, reading at uh, the TTY and uh, you'll have to reboot the system. Uh, it's it should be easily instantiable for over uh, similar devices, but uh, yet uh, I have only for runner. Uh, so um, I've made the uh, images with uh, Debian installer. It can run on the free runner. We can uh, install it, reboot, it works. But uh, all the changes that have been made have not been integrated yet. Uh, and uh, as I said before, um, the patches I sent uh, to, to the Linux kernel haven't been uh, reviewed yet. Other things to do. Um, there is something to uh, in the PKG to um, to exclude uh, some paths to uh, from an uh, installation that uh, can save a place a space when uh, installing uh, your old stuff, like uh, you can uh, skip uh, your shared doc. 
Euh, J'y arrive plus. Euh, Flash support. Euh, support euh, Partman. Uh, it doesn't make much sense in under FR since uh, you have uh, only uh, a few, uh, a really small memory. Uh, I, I want to support other devices, but uh, <laughs> I've not finished uh, with uh, Kubernetes. yet. So uh, what you can do is try my work if you have a Kubernetes. Uh, and uh, yeah. Hi, <coughs> I'm Jeremy Koenig and I'm working together with Samuel Thibault on the Debian installer for Herd. So you probably know Herd is an alternative kernel for Debian, uh, like KPBSD, for instance. And it's based on a micro kernel, and most of the stuff is implemented in user space. So for instance, the whole file system code is in user space as a collection of demons which interact with each other to provide a file system. So <coughs> Samuel had already done some work for generating the boot images. And I've been porting more packages. So since DI is a collection of packages, porting DI is mainly porting the packages to herd. And I've been fixing bugs and adding functionality to herd in order for the installer to function. So there's a lot of small parts involved, so I've just um, taken a few examples of the, the work I have been doing on Herd to make DI work. So <coughs> one cool thing is in Herd is the user space partition stores. Uh, the um, the device drivers are in Mac, the microkernel, and currently there are specific partition devices in Mac. So Mac will interpret the partition table and show the user space uh, series of partitions. But the newer part stores run in user space, and they access the whole device in Mac and provide provide partitions. So in Herd, there's not really such a thing as a device node. Since the file system is in user space, you have a special daemon with it which is attached to a given file and will interact with the kernel for the input output in the case of block devices. So currently, the translators, the daemons are called translators, which are attached on the um, block devices in uh, slash dev. Uh, interact both with the file system and the kernel to, to bind the two. Uh, so the new structure would be have a um, full device translator which accesses the device in the kernel and have separate translators for each partition which access the first translator and give access to a given partition. So it would be more flexible, so you could, for instance, have um, a disk image file, and any user could create pseudo device nodes for the partitions inside the disk image. Or you could have, say, a disk image within a partition and have partitions inside this partition. So in Linux, you would have to play with the uh, loopback devices and give offsets, which you have to compute manually. Here you could have partition translators on top of your disk image file or whatever device you want. So the work I have been doing on this is fixing the default pager uh, which handles swapping to work with them and I've also fixed grub since um, 
on a user space partition store, Goeb would see that the underlying device is a whole, whole disk. So it, it would fail to detect the partition on which uh, the files are stored. And what could still be known um, would be to, to have a translator which you can put on top of a whole on top of a whole device, which would provide a directory with all the partitions inside. So you don't have to create individual partition nodes for each partition on the device. Um, another part of HERD I've been working on in the is the HERD console, which runs in user space two, is based on BGA text mode, but it has a very cool feature where um, you can have a font larger than the 512 glyphs which VGA text mode supports and the glyphs are dynamically allocated so at any given time you can only show 512 of them but your font could be much larger and include the glyphs for many languages so even though the installer on herd uses VGA text mode. Uh, it's pixel for pixel identical to the Linux installer and Bogle VPN. So depending on which language you choose, the right glyphs will be loaded in memory and it's okay. So I've worked on that. I've added double width glyph support for Chinese and Japanese and Korean, I think. And one drawback of the console is we still don't have, um, we can load key maps. So for internationalization, um, <laughs> it's not that good. Another cool feature of the console is that it splits in a server process which has the character matrix stored and handles the terminal I.O. and a front end which will run with the VGA driver, for instance which connects to the server, but there is also a curses driver, so you could log into your installation over SSH and take over the console from there. Okay, so the installer works. You can... Uh, you can grab it there. And I'd be glad if you could have a look and tell me how it goes. So basically that's it. I think I'm going to pass the mic to the next student. And here? Okay, which one? Okay. So the next student isn't here, so I'm going to do really fast for him. Uh, his, pro his project is to implement correctly multi-arc in APT. And about multi-arc, you might have heard about the last fun story about Flash in Linux, which is NW decided that if you're running 64-bit, then no playing Flash for you. Because they decided that uh, there were security issues and they didn't feel like fixing it. So the problem uh, with Flash currently, uh, that the way to get it to work currently is to so first remove the old version and install something that doesn't quite work or the other way around is to uh, download something that will download the 32-bit version and unpack it somewhere strange and then repack it and then install it in a strange way. So the problem with this is that it's not very secure because you don't have any support from any maintainer, so security issues are just going to exist without any supervision. Uh, the solution is to create IA32-something packages, which reproduce the 32-bit architecture, but in the AMD64 repository, which is quite, of ri quite ridiculous because you basically end up with a copy of <coughs> the 32-bit archive inside the 64-bit one. Uh, the solution would be to 
actually be able to reuse the i386 packages on an AMD64 installation. And the solution for this is multi-arc, where you could be able to install a package from another architecture, provided that yours is able to run it. Uh, so if you don't really care about Flash, uh, it will still help you because there's lots of software that just don't run, uh, that just don't, can't be compiled in 64-bit or can't run natively in 64-bit, so you still have to use 32-bit software. And there are all kind of funny things with cross-compilation, so you don't really want to do that on your uh, desktop. And if we have proper multi arcs then we can uh, remove all these dummy packages and so on. Uh, so multi arc is almost mm, somewhat ready. It's waiting somewhere, and you can play with it. It's in experimental. And yeah, it's all up to you to help with using it. It's not quite ready for the end user, but uh, it's it's already mostly supported in uh, Aptitude and uh, many of the APT libraries. So you can already start having fun with it by going and getting APT from Experimental, testing it, reading the multi arc spec at this URL, and reading the blog of the student. And there are a few links that you can look up. Next student. So hi all, I'm Peter from Czech Republic and I'm working on a smart upload server with mentoring from George Jasper. Have you have you guys seen him? Because I did not. No. So maybe next time. So current state, uh, if, if you upload package to Debian, have you ever done this? Some of you. I guess so. So you use FTP based solution when there is cron runs Debian queued uh, daemon which will then uh, do the stuff for you. And uh, this solution is good because it works, but uh, nothing in the upload knows what is coming in until, until the, the last file is uploaded because it's the actual changes file which describes the upload itself. So what can happen? You upload the files to the server, you know, all the files in the package and then the last. And then uh, the DQ realized that uh, there is actually a newer version of the package. So it rejects all the uh, all the files you uploaded. My solution is based over HTTP and Python, and it started with changes file, and it works it on test early and report early stuff and check every file and re reject it uh, instantly. When you upload it, it says you if it's okay or it's not. So uh, next time you upload the uh, the you upload the uh, old package. You put the changes file first in the server response that it's old and uh, you don't have to upload uh, all the files. And uh, what is done right now is the protocol for uploading is set and uh, it works and uh, the checks are performed. It's not just about the version, it's about checksums, it's about LinTN and it's about uh, some other stuff. And uh, what's going to be it's DAC integration to you really can, uh, really can use it for uploads. And uh, there will be some clearance provided, but uh, this side would be really open. It's just uh, use some uh, HTTP so you can write the client and someone wrote it in, I think, 15 seconds when you see this. So, and you can, you can do that. Uh, here you can see the repo. But you can comment, hat, hack it, uh, there is a wiki and stuff. So, and that's it. And thanks for your attention.